utterance of, nice dress, nice dress, uh, perhaps to a woman who passes by in the street. In this case, it is fairly, fairly clear that an assertion has been made, okay, even though it's just the words nice dress, right? That's just a noun phrase. There's no verb, there's no verb phrase. Um, it is fairly clear that an assertion has been made whose content is a singular proposition about the object in question, the dress, to the effect that it's a nice dress. However, it is intuitively plausible to suppose, in this case, that the speaker simply intended her utterance to be shorthand for, that is a nice dress. I read that in, in my jaw drop. Shorthand, what's this? You know what expression is shorthand for something else? Hmm, sounds a lot like what I'm thinking about when I talk about speaking loosely as opposed to uh, speaking strictly. Interestingly, uh, according to uh, Stanley, um, Stanley later recanted and <laughs> no longer <laughs> holds this in view, which suggests all the more reason that it, it might suggest that there's some, some kind of group. Because you see, he's not saying here what he said before about semantics. He's not saying here, oh look, intuitively, right? The intuitive truth conditions are kind of when ask normal speakers about it. Intuitively, what's being said here is that that is a nice dress, okay? So we better beef up our semantics in order to get the grammatical sentence, that is a nice dress, from the mere phrase, nice dress, right? He's not saying that here. He's allowing, well, there could be shorthand. Maybe we don't bother saying the whole thing. We just say part of it, even though we're doing the whole thing. Um, and then he's got this other passage. Lisa utters one, every bottle is empty. And among other things, he goes on and he says, had Lisa been more explicit, she could have conveyed the same proposition by uttering, uh, you know, articulating, I think. Um, 10, instead, every bottle I just bought is empty. Okay? This is like the example about uh, everybody listening to the gas. Lisa might say every bottle is empty when what she really means is every bottle I just bought is empty. Okay? And then the question again is what was said in each of these utterances? And here he says something about had Lisa been more explicit, she could have conveyed the same proposition by uttering 10. Well, this talk about more explicit as opposed to less explicit and recognizing that we can come up with uh, different semantic contents uh, depending on whether we construe the utterances more explicit or less explicit. This is very close to, it sounds to me a lot like the distinction I want to make between speaking loosely and speaking strictly. Um, Robin Karsten also seems to accept my, my relatively strict understanding of what's said even though she doesn't put it that way. Uh, she's considering these examples. These get discussed a lot. Mending this fault will take time. The North Island is some distance from the South Island. Something has happened. Right? She says, given reference fixing, each of these expresses a trivial, obvious truth. Expresses. What's this expresses? Maybe that's her way of talking about what I want to say. Because I want to say in each of these sentences, what's said is a trivial, obvious proposition. Okay? And But she wants to say, no, 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 that's not what's said. But she does allow that the sentences, these sentences, express trivial, obvious truths. Okay? So again, it might seem like really there isn't a substantial art disagreement here. Um, they, like I, are willing to make a distinction between something like strict, exact, precise what's said, as opposed to something a little bit looser or something in some different category. Um, Karsten, however, insists, as um, Rekhanani is very big about, very big on this also, 
Karsten insists that, uh, no, there's a real significant difference here. It's not just a matter of terminology. How come? She says, although I see no place for a concept of what is said in either Grice's or Bach's sense, and that's more or less the narrow, strict sense that um, although I, need, I, I see no place for such a concept within the sort of cognitive processing account that I'm committed to, I have to allow that perhaps it has a role to play in some other sort of account of what is involved in utterance and meaning. Okay, now what is she talking about? Um, she and Reconati um, will both say, look, you could talk about uh, what's said in an utterance of a sentence like this, Ilana is a real sergeant. Sar sar you could talk about what's said in a strict sense, as I favor doing. <coughs> but there's no point, because that that strict, narrow content doesn't play any significant role in our cognitive processing. Right? Rekhanani says this too. If you're actually, if what you're doing is trying to figure out how is it that somebody says Ilana is a drill sergeant, and we understand from that that they think that um, she's very strict with her children, they say, look, we can do this, that, and the other thing, and thereby wind up explaining how we interpret utterances like that and, and correctly understand what the person meant without at all mentioning what's said in, in the strict, narrow sense. We don't need to do it. This seems strange to me, because I would have thought that if somebody says Imani is a drill sergeant, I as a listener have to decide whether that's meant literally or metaphorically. If I'm going to get to the conclusion that what the person meant is to utter this metaphorically, and thereby convey that Ilana is very strict with the children. How does that happen? It would seem to me it happens by my, at some stage, and there's all kinds of very oversimplified sort of linear uh, uh, processes that are suggested here as, as the way the interpretation goes, which I think is terribly oversimplified and, and not a good way to put it. However, I think that somewhere along the line, in order to figure out that my speaker is speaking metaphorically, um, I'm going to consider the proposition that Ilana is a drill sergeant, and I'm going to consider how likely it is, given all the circumstances and the context, that this is what my speaker is trying to convey to me. So it would seem to me that the narrow construal of what's said does play a role in cognitive processing. But I won't stand on that. I don't claim to be uh, studying empirically how cognitive processing works. However, I think that the notion of what's said is very significant for us as philosophers um, for different reasons that go mainly in two directions. I'm just going to mention this very briefly. Um, first of all, What's said, what we say about what's said has to connect with a lot of things that we say about truth. Why? Because what's said by uttering a sentence S in a context C is true if and only if an utterance of the sentence S in context C is true. It's true if and only if the sentence S is true in context C. It's true if and only if the proposition expressed by S in C is true. In other words, our conceptions of what's said and what we're going to say about what's said has to square with what we're going to say about what it is for an utterance to be true in a certain context or for a sentence to be true or for the proposition expressed by a sentence to be true. These things have to square. And so we can't just arbitrarily take what's said as whatever we feel like. Secondly, um, what we say about what's said has to square with what we want to say about indirect discourse. Whatever is to be said about what's said and semantic content has to square with the semantics of indirect discourse. That's because what's said by uttering a sentence S in the context C is that P, 
That's true if and only if, by uttering S and C, the speaker said that P, right? In other words, our semantics of sentences of the form so and so said that such and such. That has to square with what we're going to say about what's said by uttering a given sentence in the context. Okay, so you can't just go ahead, and, it's not just arbitrary. You want to call this what's said, fine. You don't want to call this what's said, call it something else. As long as we're also concerned about the semantics of saying that and about conceptions of truth and what it is that makes a sentence true in a given context. Um, then we have to be mindful of how we construe what's said. So uh, to conclude, I, I just want to bring you this other quote from Stanley. <laughs> Couldn't believe this. <laughs> he says, he writes, never, never mind what he says, he writes. <laughs> he articulates. He articulates. The two most controversial properties of nominal restriction theory. Nominal restriction theory is his syntactic theory, his grammatical theory about how whenever you have a noun phrase in a sentence, you also have in the sentence something that indicates how the uh, domain of quantification is restricted. Okay? And exactly what that something is and how it works, uh, these are questions that he, he, at one point he felt one way, and then he felt a different way, and he thinks that they're interesting more questions. Okay? But nominal restriction theory is, is any of these theories that, that um, try to stick the extra stuff that you need for domain restriction and so on into the grammatical sentence and explain how it gets there. So he says the two most controversial properties of nominal restriction theory are first that quantifier domain indices are associated with nominal expressions rather than with quantificational determiners. And second, that it postulates function variables rather than variables for just properties of sets in the syntactic structure of sentences containing quantified noun phrases. I can explain what that means. Um, but rather than do that, I, I just want to point out that it seems very strange to me because I would have thought that the most controversial property of NMRT is that it's an expansion view as opposed to an explicit view. That would seem to me where the, most of the controversy lies. Now, one possibility is that's what Stanley meant when he said the two most controversial properties of NMRT are this. What maybe what he meant was the two most controversial properties of NMRT aside from the fact that it's an expansion are these two things, right? Um, in which case, there's a question about what he said, right? So on the one hand, um, if he meant that he was only talking about um, uh, the two most controversial properties, aside from the fact that NRT is expansion view, um, then you have to say that's what he actually said here, which doesn't seem to be like that's what he said here. On the other hand, um, if that's not what he meant, if he actually only meant what he's literally exactly explicitly saying here, namely that these are the two most controversial properties, and oh yeah, the argument between the expansion view and the explicit view, well, that's not as controversial. Um, if that's an indication of what's intuitive and what isn't, then I have nothing else to say. <laughs> I'm not sure I agree with the way you describe his view as a sort of, you use the term expansion all the time. Uh, 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 for uh, as applied to Stanley, right? Uh, Stanley is Zabo. Uh, I'm not sure uh, what exactly you mean by that. Um, if I understand their position, um, they are opposing a sort of view that uh, when I when I use, for example, a quantifier like everybody can, everybody liked your talk. Um, you should not understand my words, uh, my expanded words, like everybody who came to your talk. 
uh, like that. What you should understand, I mean, if you, if you want to talk about expansion, is, is this expansion in the logical form of the, uh, the sentence. Like in the, in, the, there's a, in the logical form of the sentence, there's a sort of hidden variable. Um, so I, I'm not sure what you want to think by expansion. If in one sense, is clearly not what they mean, because they criticize that view. That's what they call the synthetic ellipses approach or something like that. Uh, when you when you say a quantifier, what it, what you actually mean is a is an expanded quantifier, right? Um, they want to say it's not merely what you mean. Right. right. What you mean is that is but what you mean is, is something with a hidden variable, and that variable takes a value from the context of utterance. Um, what what you mean includes reference to some things that weren't mentioned. Uh, right. Explicitly, yes. Right. There's no argument about what we mean when we say these things. Right. Okay. The people on both sides agree that when we say something like "everybody is enthusiastically," what you typically mean and what you should be understood as having meant is everybody who came to my talk today was enthusiastically. So there's no disagreement about that. Oh, I think there is. Um, um, oh. I think that I, I, for example, I would say uh, there is a literal meaning. Everybody. Uh -huh. Like their talk, <laughs> the whole world, mm -hmm. and we pragmatically infer that. Well, look, this is obviously false, but he means something true that people who came to his talk uh, liked his talk. Right. Um, you can do that. I mean, that that's something that they don't like. Uh, apparently, you don't like, but I think that some people think like that. No, I, I don't understand. I don't yeah. understand. I'm saying that uh, among others, both Stanley and I agree. Right. That when you utter this short sentence, typically what you mean is the proposition that's expressed by the longer sentence. <coughs> On that much both oh, sides okay, agree. Okay. Okay. okay? okay. So then the question is, well, so how does it happen? And, and what exactly are the relations between the different parts? What he's saying is, look, since intuitively we're going to say that the truth conditions of the first sentence are that everybody who came to my talk today listened enthusiastically. Since that's what intuitively we would say, then by golly, the semantic theory damn well better give it to us. So, oh, wait a second. In the first sentence, there's no reference to my talk today. Well, let's posit, aside from the first sentence, let's posit this grammatical sentence or logical form, and let's make it part of the grammatical theory of the language that wherever you have a nominal expression, there is, in logical form, there's some indication of a, uh, um, a domain of discourse. Okay? And that's something that semantic, the semantic theory has to give us. Okay? They're quite insistent about it, that, that they don't accept unarticulated constituents. Because they'll say, no, wait a second, look. If intuitively it's there, then it really is there. Okay, it's not there in the phonological sense, but then it's there in the grammatical sense. And it's the job of the semantic theory to give you the grammatical sense. So that's why every time where there's a nominalism, you know, there, there are different ways uh, that you can try to beef it up. I mean, other, a more natural, more common approach has been to suggest that a quantifier carries with it implicitly an indication Right? And, and he explains why, for various reasons, he doesn't like doing it that way. But exactly how you do it isn't the point. The point is that he thinks the semantic theory is responsible for getting you from everybody listening enthusiastically to something that includes a domain of, a restricted domain of discourse. Okay? And he thinks that what's said in the first sense, in the sense everybody listening enthusiastically, What's said is the proposition that's meant, that longer one, okay? That's why I call it an expansionist. Oh, okay. He thinks that the expanded sentence is what you're actually saying. You're not just implying it, you're not just indicating it in some pragmatic way, blah, blah, blah. You're actually saying it. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> let's see. <laughs> Um, I'm certainly more sympathetic to your line than to Stanley's on these issues, uh, but I 
think we differ on something. So let me mention that and see where where we are. Um, when you say what's said, I take it you typically mean what the speaker said, not what the sentence uttered said. What the sentence expresses. I don't think sentences talk. Well, I'm not saying oh, they talk. The, the, proposition, <laughs> the proposition expressed by the sentence. Yeah, expressed. Right. So. Um, it's a little bit problematic, but roughly I would identify between the proposition expressed by the sentence and what's said by a speaker yeah. uttering the sentence. So, right? and, so, and Soames, Soames says what he says because he makes this distinction. Yeah, I, I, I get that that's more or less where you're coming from. So, but what I want to say is what the speaker says is a non-semantic issue. It has nothing to do with semantics. What cognitive processes go on and so on, the thing is completely non-semantic. This is that's psychology, that's something else. It's not semantics. I agree with the second part, but not the first part. I know. Right? So, so, so I want to say yeah. what what's said by the speaker is just not a semantic. That's a pragmatic issue. That's what did the speaker assert? And that's I think not semantics at all. That nothing to do with semantics. Uh, it might be that there's a notion of assertion, which is semantic, but it's a very specialized, it's really what is literally, what the speaker literally says is what the sentence that the speaker used expresses. Okay, That might be a terminological issue, but I think that the semantic issues are with the sentence and what it literally expresses, what it expresses semantically. What the speaker manages to assert, that's a different, this is not semantics, that's pragmatics. Uh, I, I'm much closer to you on this than Stanley because he's way he's off the charts on this thing. Um, now, um, so so I want to think, say that um, insofar as I, I mean, it's, it's interesting what the question of what a speaker asserts, although I think it's not semantics, I still think it's, it could be an interesting philosophical question. What does the speaker say? What does the speaker assert? But I'm, I'm worried that there might be different ways of saying in this sense. There might be literal assertion. You call it strict and yeah, strict, literal. Strictly and loosely. Well, I, have, I make a general distinction between speaking loosely and speaking strictly. Strictly. Okay, and so you have this notion of what did the speaker say? You'd say, did the speaker say this strictly and literally? Or something like that. Right. So, yes, I think there's such a thing as literal assertion. There's such a thing as explicit assertion. What did the speaker explicitly assert? Uh, which may not be the same thing as what the speaker literally asserts. Which is why we say it's this thing and literally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then what did the speaker assert? Maybe that's your loose sense, right? Um, loosely, that is to say. Again, I want to say I don't think any of these issues are semantic, except maybe the, the explicit or literal, maybe that's semantic. Yeah, uh, on the, um, right. And, and uh, this is what enables Soames to say what he wants to say about this, um, which involves uh, equating what's said with what's asserted and construing that as, as pretty much completely pragmatical. Yeah, so um, please it, just say it has to do with different ideas about uh, what saying is, yeah. right? And the mm -hmm. traditional notion of crisis, mm -hmm. um, which I don't stick to entirely right. for various reasons, but um, an important part of it is something about how. What's said has to has to uh, correspond closely to the words and form of the sentence that's uttered, right? It's it's not supposed to be just. Yeah. Um, I think that uh, I would even go so far, and it's actually something that um, Price seems to do in some places explicitly. Um, I would even go so far as to say that what's said has to be constrained to uh, what's semantically expressed or to the semantic contents. Yeah. Or something like well, that. I, yeah, I think there's a notion of, of saying that yeah. that can be defined in terms of what the sentence used literally expresses. And right. You can call that literal, right. literal assertion. But there's also a notion of assertion, I think, that doesn't follow what the sentence used literally expresses. Yeah, I don't know what to say about assertion. I don't feel um, uh, I don't feel strongly. Okay, about let me just say about the particular examples. Um, the sentence everybody listened enthusiastically. Um, 
I suppose that literally that expresses everybody in the universe, you know, listened enthusiastically. The set, I'm just talking about the sentence. Mm -hmm. The sentence, everybody listened enthusiastically, probably literally means something like everybody in the, in the universe at some point in the past right. listened enthusiastically, who knows to what, right? That's not mentioned in the sentence or anything, right? So the sentence, what the sentence literally means, if it literally means any proposition at all, is probably not even close to what you meant. Right? Um, should I say that that's nevertheless what you said? Maybe in some literal sense that's what you said. Strictly speaking. Yes, yeah, strictly, literally, explicitly, that's what you said. Uh, but I'm inclined, I would never just sort of flat out attribute to you the assertion that everybody in the universe at some point in the past listened enthusiastically, who knows to what. <laughs> um, on the other hand, with the Scott Soames example, I am Scott Soames, um, my, my intuition is that he, he just didn't say that his name was anything. He didn't say his name was anything. Right? Um, he, he conveyed that that was his name. People got that information from what he said, but he didn't say that his name was Scott. Preaching to the converted. What's that? You're preaching to the choir. Yeah, I know. So I, I'm sort of. I'm not sure why I have these intuitions and what the principle, maybe there's no principle, maybe I'm just, you know, just throwing out unprincipled intuitions. <laughs> but, but I'm inclined to think that there's some kind of, it may be that one asserts many things in uttering a single sentence, in using a single sentence, and that maybe you assert one thing literally, one thing loosely, a different thing, and so, and you've said both of those things. So maybe the phrase, what says, the wrong phrase to use, if that presupposes that there's exactly one thing that's said. If you said three, four, five different things using, using the same. That doesn't mean that the sentence is ambiguous. The sentence expresses one proposition, but you use it and you hear it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, okay. So look, um, right. I make a distinction between what's said, strictly speaking, and what's said, loosely speaking. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of what other people insist is what's said, I say, well, only loosely speaking, mm -hmm. not strictly speaking. Mm -hmm. I still think that that's an important distinction for what the reasons that I said at the end. I mean, it's going to affect our, our truth conditions about, about semantics. I remember one time I mentioned to you, somebody said to me, it was, it was uh, Takashi, mm -hmm. so, uh, was asking me, a question about your theory and Kermit's theory. And, and, and he was arguing that, he, he was saying, look, there seems to be a, a structural uh, similarity there in terms of these intermediate things and the transition, yeah. term, relation, and so on. Um, so it's really the same view, right? And, and I told you about that. And, and you said, no, because we have different truth conditions <laughs> right. for, for a sentence of the form so and so believes this such and such. Right? And so I'm saying the truth conditions that we get for the sentences, so and so said that such and such, we got to make those right. Mm -hmm. And so we can't just uh, go wherever we want. It says yeah. that. Okay, so in any case, what I want to say is I've got this said that, strictly speaking, I've got a looser conception to accommodate whatever anybody else wants to say. As for assertion, um, Part of the reason that I'm uneasy with it is because I'm not sure what it's supposed to capture that is neither um, what's or part of what is said, loosely speaking, and on the other hand, what's meant, right? The way a lot of people talk, it looks like they're assuming that what you asserted is what you meant. And if you were speaking sarcastically, then you meant the other thing. So that's what you asserted. And if you were speaking metaphorically, and so you meant that. So that's what you asserted. So, uh, okay, you want to talk about what's meant? Fine. That is strictly pragmatic, right? And then there are the interesting questions about how the semantic stuff is about pragmatic stuff. But I don't know, I haven't been able to develop for myself a robust notion of a cert that's, that's in between those. Um, and they claim they have that it. sounds like a hard, a hard task. But I think where you and I do agree, and, and Stanley and his company disagree, uh, is that what semantics is concerned with is what proposition the sentence expresses and its truth value. Yeah, yeah. That's semantics. Yeah, yeah. No, it's only Scott who says weird things about that. 
Yeah, because he makes this distinction between the proposition expressed and what it's said. But he keeps what's said the same as what's asserted. Well, I, do, I think I do all that too, oh, but okay. I put that all in the pragmatics. Well, yeah, I think. And I think you're putting, I think you have a notion of said that's, that's more semantic. That's is yeah. extremely semantic. Yeah, so I think we we agree on what semantics ought to be, or is really, yeah. concerned with, which is this proposition expressed, its truth value, yeah. what people mean, or what their utterances might be elliptical for, and all that, let alone cognitive processing. That's not semantic. Yeah. <laughs> not yeah. And I have to tell you, the last time I gave this talk, it was uh, at a rather chilly reception uh, from an audience that included a whole bunch of uh, more sort of neo Chomsky and realists. Um, and, and when I would say things like, look, um, on the face of it, it would seem intuitive to say that if I only said everybody else was enthusiastic, and say everybody can talk to those people. On the face of it, intuitively, in the shorter sentence, I didn't say anything about my talk. And I said, well, why should you think that? Why, what's intuitive about that? What's unintuitive about thinking that when you said everybody, you were talking, you, you were actually uh, saying something about everybody who came to the talk, that it's part of the uh, semantic content. And I just, huh? Yeah, but I'm, I'm sympathetic with you. <laughs> um, you and I have? Yeah, I know. says Ah, right. Yeah. Yeah, that's some, so what Teresa, I think, is saying is that the verb to say, especially as attached to a speaker, the speaker says, uh, she she tends to use it in a more semantic way, whereas I think that no, it's really just a pragmatic concept which might mirror or <coughs> parallel semantics to some extent, but we shouldn't expect it to do so completely. Yeah. Um, uh, Jason Sunny has this uh, sort of this argument for the presence of uh, hidden variables. Uh, that he describes as a sort of binding argument, right? Mm -hmm. uh, if you place a quantifier in front of it, well, it's, there. it's binding something, so there must be a hidden variable there. Uh, do you have any reaction to that argument? I mean, or yeah, any, it's any sort of. <laughs> it's, a, it's a really bad argument, and I don't understand why so many seemingly smart people have given so much attention. How does this argument go? Well, it, it's supposed to be an argument. Like he said, everybody that came to my talk, everybody listened enthusiastically. Um, uh, the argument is supposed to show that there is a, a hidden variable in there, um, uh, <coughs> like uh, whatever, whatever uh, Jonathan goes, everybody listens enthusiastically. So since you place the quantified phrase in front of it, uh, whatever he goes, whatever uh, Jonathan goes, um, and it obviously changed uh, the, the meaning, the interpretation of the subordinate clause, so uh, the quantified phrase must be binding uh, a variable there, a variable uh, like everybody. Everybody comes with a variable. You only can see it because it's hidden, but you can uh, notice its presence if you put, if you place a, a quantified phrase in front of it. That's that's an argument uh, um, uh, used by. Um, no. No, you may be right. I'm just trying to figure out why, right. why he would think of this. Why? <laughs> uh, let, let me, I'm, I'm looking at something. I actually have something about that. But it sounds like the ellipsis view that he's arguing against this hidden variable, so this thing's elliptical for some other variable. He argues no, the ellipsis view is that uh, whenever you say everybody liked his talk, uh, what it, uh, the, the expression you should understand an extended expression, everybody who came to this talk. So that's the expression that's that you should take into consideration. Okay. Yeah. Right? Um, but funny. Sorry, funny you should ask. <laughs> um, OK, so they have this argument. Uh, it appears in different versions in different places. Um, take a sentence like, John failed exactly three French right? And you can go on and say, in fact, 
In most classes John has taught, he has. Okay? Meaning he, yes. Um, so two, in, in fact, in most classes John has taught, he has. They say, well look, that's elliptical for 2e. In most classes John has taught, he has failed exactly three Frenchmen. Right? When you say 2, it's actually elliptical for 2e. This shouldn't be, that, that part of it shouldn't be too yeah. controversial. And then they say, okay, look, the natural reading of 2e is 2n. In most classes x, such that John has taught x, he has failed exactly three Frenchmen in x. Right? Okay, so. So the logical form of 1 must be that of the main clause of 2n. John failed exactly 3 French in x. Right? You see, in this, in this sentence here, <coughs> there's no mention of a restricted domain says John failed exactly three Frenchmen. They want to argue that there's a hidden variable in logical form to get you the domain. And the way they do it is they say, well, look, 2 is elliptical for 2e, right? <clears throat> Where exactly three Frenchmen is mentioned. What's the natural reading of 2e, the sort of semi-logical way of putting it? In most classes, x such that John has taught x. He has failed exactly three Frenchmen in X. Right? You see, you get you get the the, the main the main clause. He has failed exactly three Frenchmen. Is he has failed exactly three Frenchmen in X? You need to have this extra bit here because you've got to have this quantifier, this uh variable bound by this quantifier. And so they say that shows us that there must have been, and John failed exactly three Frenchmen here. There must have already been, implicitly, a placeholder so that later on you can find it with this quantifier here. Okay? That's how the argument goes. No kidding. So, <clears throat> and what I wonder is, how about this? This is the same the same form. Uh, wait a second. This is <laughs> sorry. Wait a minute. No, I'm sorry. This is still there. This discourse of two sentences. Jack has been kind to Jill. In fact, there are several ways he has. Okay, as they argued before, <coughs> two then can be construed as elliptical for two e. There are several ways he has been kind to Jill. The natural reading of which is there are several x such that x is a way of being kind, and Jack has been kind to Jill by x. Okay, so by parity of form, as they concluded before, it should follow that the logical form of Jack has been kind to Jill is <coughs> Jack has been kind to Jill has to be 
the same as this last clause here. Namely, Jack has been kind to Jill by X. <laughs> Right? It would have to be that every time we have a sentence like this, there's also a hidden variable for the manner in which he did this. Because after all, <coughs> this gets put elliptically. Uh, this gets expanded elliptically to this, um, which can be bound so that you've got a quantifier bounding, binding this variable all the way over here. So that variable had to be there to get bound. That's how the argument goes. Um, uh, uh, Kaplan and McCourt have a lot of discussion of the uh, binding argument. So you're saying um, if you're- Not all of it is good, but some of it is, is right on. And I think that they do some different Examples, but I think that there are lots of examples. Of that. I, I just can't understand why the binding argument has been so widely discussed. Just it seems like a nonsense. So, I mean, on their view, sentence one is an open sentence. It doesn't have truth value. Well, they don't discuss sentence one. This, I'm bringing this as a reductio. Oh, okay. I'm saying if your if your reasoning about yeah, yeah. that other sentence is right, about mm -hmm. Bill uh, John flunked three, three, three Frenchmen, Frenchmen, right? If their argument about that one was was right, mm -hmm. then for the same reason, by by parity form, they have to say the same thing about a sentence like this. And and there's lots of different examples that I have that. So I, I just don't, it's, it's not really fair pushing that too much without having really spread out what they say about the argument. But I, I have not been able to get a coherent, plausible argument there. So your reply is that if you, if you admit a hidden variable for a uh, for domain, you have to admit all sorts of variables, right? Yes, For and so, and so and what, what Stanley has said, <coughs> I think it's in the, the postscript of the book or something like that. <coughs> what Stanley said at one point is, um, yeah, okay, people argue that the, uh, the binding test is uh, something like over-generating or something like that, um, which is to say, it seems to have a lot of counterexamples. Um, so then he mentions, there's uh, a paper by Louisa Marti where she discusses uh, a sort of a test that presumably distinguishes between these kinds of cases and, and the particular examples that they give. Um, but I don't think it does, I don't think it comes close to it. And, and frankly, it seems to me to be based on a complete disregard for the distinction between uh, what, between semantic content and kinetic, between what's meant and what's said. Um, when she's arguing a point about something belonging to semantic content, she says, and by pricing considerations, you know, like uh, honoring maxims and so on and so forth. And I think, but that's not about semantic content. That gives you implicature or something. Yeah, so, but I'm sorry, those are things that I didn't prepare. Now, uh, may I ask another question? No. Here's a, now a, a different question, um, and now it's favorable to your position. You're saying, well, look, uh, whether this um, minim minimal semantic content, or let's say the, the literal semantic content, whether this, this has some sort of import for the speaker, or whether he discrosses his mind, or has some psychological or a reality, uh, I don't know, uh, it could be, it could not be. But would, would that be a sort of empirical uh, um, um, evidence for your position? That uh, people with very, very little knowledge of uh, language, right, like some Chinese guy starts learning Portuguese, whenever they look at a sentence, a, 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 a sentence in, the, in that language that they are learning, and they don't know the very complex uh, metaphorical context, what that sentence might mean, they always go straight to, for the, to the literal interpretation. That's the first thing that crosses their mind. 
And only later they learn, well, look, when you say, uh, don't throw water in my face, you don't really mean don't throw water in my face, you're meaning, well, be nice to me, something like that. Um, but people always go, people always go straight to yeah, the literal well, interpretation when they, they are not aware of this complex uh, uh, network of... Uh, surely, yeah. often, people start out with uh, strict literal interpretation. Yeah. But um, Reganati and Karsten and, and so on um, insist that this is often, if not generally, not the case. That there's all kinds of cases and, and there's, there's actually, you know, experiments looking into how fast people respond to different kinds of utterances when they've been primed in different ways and so on. Um, that make it look like there are times when um, uh, they don't entertain all at once the proposition is literally expressed. Um, maybe a good example is this when I said, you know, everybody listen politely at the talk. Oh, no, I'm sorry, I say everybody listen politely. Um, it's not clear that uh, to understand my utterance that you need to first consider this completely unrestricted generalization and then think, hmm, what's the relevant domain of discourse here that we talk about? You might, because of the context, have already assumed that any quantifier that's going to come down is going to be restricted to a certain context. So when you hear the quantifier, you immediately tack in the restriction, never entertaining the understanding. Just as an example. But frankly, for me, all I have to do, I mean, the dialectics is easier for me. All I have to do is show that sometimes, empirically, sometimes, uh, we do, in fact, make use of the minimal proposition um, in order to go through our kind of processing. And, um, yeah, they, they don't think that that happens. Nothing. Thanks a lot.